Okay. In this video, what we will discuss is uh, a continuation of capital structure policy. No? Essentially, what we want to do is to relax the assumptions of the Modigliani and Miller theory no, of capital structure. In the first um, introduction of market imperfection that we will have to contend with is what is the impact of practice on the Modigliani and Miller theory? Will it still hold? What are the nuances we need to uh, understand and how taxes affect the optimality of capital structure? Uh, so that's something that we'll discuss in this video. So first, we need to understand the impact of taxes. Okay? So of course, corporations pay taxes on profits after interest payments are paid. No? So you deduct interest payments in the total income and the amount of that income after corporate taxes, I mean, after interest expense, you know, is the basis for the computation of corporate taxes. Okay, so therefore, when there is interest, it reduces taxes that you have to pay. Okay? And that could be an incentive to use debt. You want to use debt because it creates an opportunity for the firm to reduce the value of its debt, you know, to reduce the value of its corporate taxes. Okay, so for example, this company had earnings of um, earnings before interest and taxes EBIT of approximately 2.8 billion in 2014 and interest expense of about 400 billion. Okay. The marginal corporate tax rate of Macy's is 35%. Okay, and therefore, if you look at leverage, the base case with leverage, you know, the income tax is income before tax is 2.4 billion. If you compute 35% of that, 840 million is the taxes that needs to be paid, and the net income is 1560. Okay. If hypothetically we are to compute an equivalent income statement for Macy's. Without leverage, the EBIT will be the same, but there's no tax, uh, no interest. Therefore, the income before tax is the same as EBIT. 35% no. of that, and therefore net income is 1820. Okay. Worth considering is that if you look at the amount of taxes, okay, um, the taxes that you paid is lower without it lower with leverage than without leverage. Okay. However, with leverage net income is also lower than without leverage. Obviously 1560 is lower than 1820. So if you look at this now these numbers, it's not clear whether uh, whether um, interest really is beneficial because the net income to the shareholders is lower, right? No, pero the taxes that was paid is lower than okay, the So where is, is there a, an advantage of using that? Okay. So if you look at the total cash available to share to the different investors of the firm, okay. Remember, um, the value of the firm is equal to the value of debt plus value of equity, right? So we want to determine how much payoffs did debt holders receive, how much payoffs will equity holders receive, okay? So if you look at that perspective, let's see whether there's an improvement, okay? With leverage, how much interest were paid to debt holders? 400, that came from the previous slide, 400, okay? Oops. Okay. So 400. How much is income available to equity holders? 1560. So with leverage, if you add the two, the total cash that's available to all investors of the firm, whether debt or equity, is 1960. Without leverage, there is no payment to debt holders, but the amount that was 
available for equity holders is 1820, which is equal to the net income. Okay, this is also the net income. Okay, with leverage and net income without leverage. So if you look at this, okay, debt and equity received more with leverage. No? Received more cash flows without leverage, with leverage rather than without leverage. No? And this difference is called the tax shield due to interest. Saan ang galing yung difference na yan? Because nagbayad ka ng mas counting tax. Okay? That's where the 140 million additional came from. Okay? Because you are trying to divide the same pie. Right? What is the pie that you are trying to divide? Okay? You're trying to divide this pie to eight. Okay? You're trying to divide to eight as the pie. Okay? Yung 2.8, paano siya na-distribute? Okay? 400 for debt. 840 to the government. 1,560 to equity. If with leverage. If without leverage, okay, how was 2.8 distributed? 980 to the government. 1,820 to equity. Okay? Remember, the government is not part of the corporation. Okay? So it is an outflow with reduce, which reduces the value of the firm. Right? Correct? Value of the firm equals the value of equity plus value of debt. Okay? Wala namang plus G na government, di ba? They're not part of the corporation. Okay? So the 2.8 was divided between debt, equity, and an expense. Right? But without leverage, it was divided between equity and the government, which is an expense. You are paying an expense more, which is an outside party to the company, right? And has no, and therefore reduces the value of the firm. Okay? Mas malaki yung taxes that you paid, it reduces the value of the firm. And kokonti na lang ang paghahatian ng equity holders and debt holders. Okay? And that's the source of that increase in total payoffs no, to the different investors of the firm. Okay? That's where the 140 million uh, comes from. Okay? And that 140 million, that's called the interest tax shield. Okay? So the interest tax shield is the reduction in taxes paid due to the tax deductibility of interest. I think one thing that we need to um, definitely define further is um, this tax shield will only matter okay, if interest is tax deductible. What does it mean to be tax deductible? Ibig sabihin, minamayin no siya sa pag-determine ng tax payable. Okay? Because karina, di ba, from EBIT, minus interest, meron kang EBT. Then, dun minultiply yung tax. Right? It means interest was deducted to the income that will be the basis for the computation of taxes. Ngayon, kung interest is not tax deductible, then there is no tax shield due to interest. Okay? So the interest tax shield is equal to the corporate tax rate times interest payments. Okay? Kasi it's supposed to be, that is the amount here. That was used to deduct from EBIT. No? So that this amount will be lower so that the tax payable will also be lower. Okay? So the gain in the Macy's case no, is equal to the reduction in taxes with leverage. So that's 980 million minus 840 million is 140 million. Okay. And that is due to the interest payments of 400 million times the tax rate of 35% gives you 140 million. So this is the tax savings no? because interest expense was deducted to determine 
the amount of taxes. Okay. So for the most recent example, for the most recent fiscal year, a company had fifty three point five million in interest expense, and the firm's marginal tax rate is forty percent. What is the value of the tax yield? So that's five thirty five times forty percent. The value of the tax yield for this year is two point four three million. Okay. So therefore, what can we conclude about um, tax yield? No. The presence of interest improves the value of the firm, right? How does it improve the value of the firm? By making sure that taxes are lower, okay? So here, kita mo na agad eh, that taxes provide value, right? Because remember, under the relationship that the value of the firm is equal to the value of debt and value of equity. So therefore, the cash here under with leverage, okay, that is 1960, okay? Without leverage, that is 1820. So nakita mo na agad may increase in cash flow to the debt and equity holders. And because there's an increase in cash flow, there's an increase in value of the firm. And therefore, na maximize the value of the firm as uh, the tax shield is increasing. And the tax shield is increasing if debt is increasing. Okay. So now, remember what we computed here in the previous slide. What we computed is tax shield for a year. If there's interest, there are tax shield every year. And therefore, you can value how much is the total tax yield over time. No? And therefore, we can say that the total tax yield over time is the interest okay, that we are going to, I mean, is the value, additional value that we will get due to the presence of taxes you know, and in presence of debt. Okay? So when a firm uses debt, the interest tax yield provides a corporate tax benefit each year. Okay, and the benefit is computed as the present value of the stream of future tax yields the firm will receive. So just like any other cash flow, you can get its present value. Okay, so you can get the present value of the stream of cash flows. Now the cash flows of a levered firm pays to investors will be higher than they would be without leverage by the amount of the interest tax yield. Okay. If you look at this um, diagram, no, this is the total pre-tax cash flow. Okay, ito yung sinasabi ko na yung pre-tax cash flow ina allocate lang naman yun eh, between the government and the investors of the company. Okay, if the firm is unlevered, okay, yung pre-tax cash flow is divided to income to common shareholders or to equity and to the government. Okay, so here, this amount is 40% of the total, right? That's the amount of taxes. And therefore, what becomes the cash flows to the equity of the firm is only this much, right? And if this is, since this is unlevered, this cash flow is the equity cash flow, and it is also the basis for the unlevered cash flow, right? So, ito, this smaller box will be the basis of the valuation of the firm. Okay? Kasi yun din ang basis ng valuation of equity. Okay? Under an unlevered case. Now, if the, there is, uh, if the firm is levered with the same pre-tax cash flow, okay, you will pay a portion of it as debt. Okay? Or sorry, as interest payments. Okay, right? A portion of it will be earning, will be earnings, and a portion of it will be paid as taxes. So if you look at this diagram, the total, if you look at equity here, levered equity, this box is definitely lower, that, I mean, shorter than the unlevered version, right? But remember, in a levered firm, 
it is composed of the value of debt and the value of equity. So this, this box is equity. This box is debt. Now visually, you know that the sum of the two is higher than the unlevered version, right? So therefore, the firm value is higher in this case of the levered firm rather than its equivalent unlevered uh, firm, okay? Because of the presence of the interest tax shield. And that tax shield is this amount. Okay, precisely the total earnings of investors, equity and debt, increased by this much, which is equal to the interest tax shield, which is 40% of the level of interest. Okay, so those are the important relationships. So how do we now amend MM Proposition 1 with taxes? Okay. The amendment to that is this. The total value of the levered firm exceeds the value of the firm without leverage due to the present value of tax savings from debt. Okay. So here, we say that the value of a levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm plus the present value of the tax yield. Okay. So here we can now definitely say that leverage adds value. Right? Why does leverage add value? Because here we see that VL is greater than VU. Right? Precisely by what amount? By the amount of EV of interest tax yield. Okay. So this is the first step of determining na ah, debt might matter in the first place, right? Because debt provides value to the firm you know, by having tax shields in place. Let's have this example. Suppose a company plans to pay 100 million of interest each year for the next 10 years, okay? And then to repay the principal of 2 billion in year 10. These payments are risk-free and BFB's marginal tax rate is 35% throughout this period. If the risk-free rate is 5%, by how much does the interest tax yield increase the value of the company? Okay, so here, the interest tax yield is 35% times 100 million each year for the next 10 years. Therefore, we can value it as a 10-year annuity okay, because the tax savings are known and not risky, we can also discount them at the risk rate. Okay, so this is basically the annuity cash flows times the present value annuity factor. So if you get that present value, it's worth 270 million. So therefore, what's the interpretation of the 270 million? The presence of debt increased firm value by 270 million. Okay. And therefore, what would be the thinking here? The thinking here would be, of course, eh, di tagdagan pa natin ang dagdagan ng debt, right? It increases value. But we will know later that only to an extent. To what extent, we will cover it in this slide, in this, this lecture in, it, in another lecture, okay? So that's how you get the present value of the interest tax shield. Now, the problem is, with that approach, hindi naman kasi predictable how much is interest expense, right? Because the level of debt may be uncertain, no? And if the level of debt is uncertain, future interest payments are also uncertain. So may changes na sa interest payments. There might be changes in the tax rate. There might be changes in the interest rate of debt. No? So for simplicity, in the, in the analysis, we define what's called permanent debt, okay? So that's the second bullet. So suppose a firm borrows debt D and keeps the debt permanently. Ibig sabihin ng permanently, ni rebalance siya palagi yung portfolio niya to keep that amount of debt in place, okay? So pag nag, kunyari, nag-repay ka ng debt niya yun, mangungutang uli siya. 
para to keep the debt at that level D. D is an amount. Okay? Ngari, 10 billion pesos. Okay? If 10 billion pesos is permanent debt, under that assumption, kinikip niya palagi yung 10 billion na debt na yun. So if ma-repay siya, mag-repay siya ng 10 billion of debt, magpag-utang ulit siya ng 10 billion to keep it at a permanent level. Okay? And because it is permanent, that debt is that debt is permanent from now to forever. And therefore, the interest that you pay out of that debt is also constant from now to forever. Right? So therefore, you can value it as a perpetuity. Okay? How do you then value the interest tax yield as a perpetuity? If you remember present value rules, no? To get the present value of a perpetual cash flow, no? Puli mo yung cash flow divided by the interest rate. Okay? In this case, what's your cash flow? Your cash flow that you're trying to value is the interest tax yield. And what's the denominator? The denominator in this case is the risk free rate, RF. Okay? How do you value the interest tax yield? Okay? So that's the tax rate times interest. Okay? How do you get the, different, the interest knowing that debt will always be D? D or the amount of permanent debt times RF, which is when you multiply this, this is the annual interest, right? Times tax rate divided by RF, okay? And since you know math, okay, you know that these two will cancel each other. And therefore, the PV of interest tax yield of permanent debt is the tax rate times the amount of that permanent debt, okay? Why are we doing the assumptions of permanent debt? No, to simplify the computation. No, otherwise, we'll have to forecast debt from now until forever, get its present value. Okay? But if you know that you want to keep, keep the same amount of debt, right? 10 billion pesos, for example, I will always keep that amount as debt. Then uh, this is a simplification. No, in computing or, or determining the uh, present value of the tax yield. Okay. So if the debt is fairly priced, there should be no arbitrage. Okay. And it implies that the market value of debt is equal to the present value of its future interest payments. Okay. How do we show that? Okay. We show that that the, the present value of tax yield is equal to the present value of this, no? future interest payments times the tax rate. Okay? You get the present value. Since this is a constant, you can bring it out. So it's tax rate times present value of future interest payments. Okay? And by definition, the present value of future interest payments is equal to the debt amount. Okay. Okay. So there's a simplification there. It implies that um, there is uh, the debt is fairly priced. Okay. Otherwise, this uh, relationship won't hold. Okay. Now, what is the impact of taxes to MM proposition two, which is related to the return? Or to the WAC. Okay. Here, um, the difference is with tax deductible interest, the effective tax rate after tax, the effective WAC, you know, the tax will have to be reduced by the amount equal to 1 minus the tax rate. And the weighted average cost of capital is restated and it becomes this. You know? So the proportion of equity over total equity and debt times the return on equity plus proportion of debt you know, times cost of debt times 1 minus tax rate. And this is the impact of the tax yield. Right? If, you, if this, this portion may be expanded so that you can understand it better. You know? So what happened here is that the pre-tax swap was reduced by the value of the tax yield. And the value of the tax yield is this, D over E plus D times the 
uh, cost of debt, interest rate times the tax yield. Okay, so this is the pre-tax swap and it is reduced by this factor. Okay, looking at it graphically, let's um, look at it graphically. Yung dotted line, yun yung luma, right, under Proposition 2 okay, of Modigliani and Miller. Under Proposition 2, we know that the RU or the WAC of an unlevered, the WAC will remain constant regardless of the capital structure, okay, because the required rate of return of equity will increase to offset the higher proportion of debt in the capital structure. Okay. Now, under what with taxes, we know that the presence of debt has an additional value, right? No, it reduces the cost of capital because of this factor that it reduces. So the higher D over D E plus E is, the more negative this portion becomes. And therefore, what is reduced. So if you look at this, the like swivel downwards. No, yung graph. And this this um space between the two represents the impact of the tax shield. Okay, I say what happened was that cost of debt shifted downwards. No, because of the impact of the interest tax yield. Okay. Now, so if you look at this graph, you will see na ah, you should maximize taxes as much as possible, right? Why? Because it reduces because it reduces the cost of capital, right? But of course, hindi pa yan full explanation of capital structure policy you know, because there are so many other things which affect capital structure and we'll go by it uh, in the next few slides and in the next videos. Okay? So, nasabi ko lang, if taxes lang ang tangi imper market imperfection, then what will happen is that firms will be motivated to add more taxes to their, uh, add more debt to their capital structure. Okay? Now, what happens naman if uh, the interest tax yield is in with a target net to equity ratio? Okay? So the value of the interest tax yield can be found by comparing the value of the levered firm to the unlevered value. Because remember, the value of a levered firm value of a levered firm equals value of an unlevered firm plus present value of the interest tax yield. Okay. So you can value a firm unlevered, value the same firm as levered, and then you can get the value of the interest tax yield. So how do you do this? So let's have this example. So the company expects to have free cash flow in the coming year of 4.25 million, and its free cash flow is expected to grow at a rate of 4% per year thereafter. The company has an equity cost of capital of 10% and a debt cost of capital of 6% and it pays a corporate tax of 35%. If the company maintains a debt to equity ratio of 50-50, no, 0.5, no, uh, not 50-50 but 0.5 debt per peso of equity, no, what is the value of, of its interest tax yield? Okay. We will use this relationship. Okay, let's first value, let's get the unlevered value of the firm, okay? So you start to, to get the unlevered value of the firm, you get the present value of the free cash flows. So free cash flows in the numerator divided by, since it is perpetual, you, know, you divide it by the WAP, that is free tax, okay? minus the growth rate because it is a 
at increasing perpetuity. It increased by 4% per mm -hmm. year. And remember, in your present value theories, the present value of a growing perpetuity is the cash flow over the interest rate minus the growth rate. Okay? And that's how you compute the value, present value of a growing perpetuity. Okay. And let's apply it. How do you get the pre-tax swap? Okay. The debt to equity ratio is 0.5 over 1 plus 0.5. Okay. And the debt cost of capital is 6%. Therefore, the equity uh, relationship is 1 over 1 plus 0.5 times 10%, which is the cost of capital, cost of equity capital. And you can get that the WAP is 8.67. You have to label this, that is the pre-tax swap. Okay. With that, you can get the value of the unlevered firm. Okay. So the value of unlevered firm is 425 okay, over 8.67 minus 4%. Okay. And you will get that the value is 91 million. Okay. Once you got the value of the firm as an unlevered value of an unlevered firm, you need to value the uh, the levered version. And how do you do that? Okay. You get the levered cash flows in the numerator. Okay. And you now get the WAP post tax. Okay. Let's see how to do it. So first, we need to compute the levered value. And the first, the first step is to compute the um compute the WAC. Okay. To be to be able to compute the WAC, okay. Basically it's the same. Same weights as Kanina. No? One over 1.05 times the cost of debt. Okay. A cost of equity rather. And then you've got 0.5 over 1.05 by uh, 1.5 times the cost of debt, but it just has to be post-tax, okay? So you have to consider the tax yield, okay? And now, the post-tax swap is, is lower, 7.97, okay? And therefore, putting that in our equation, the value now of the levered firm is 107 million. And to get the value of the tax yield, we use this relationship. No? Well, we use the relationship VL equals VU plus present value of tax yield. Okay? And computing for the present value of tax yield, we need to get VL minus VU. And therefore, the increase in value, firm value, due to the interest tax yield is 16 million. Okay? Now, let's revisit recapitalizations. Remember, in MM1, what did we get? No? In MM1, ang sabi natin, the recapitalization does not have any impact on the value of debt and the value of equity. Okay? Now, that might be a different issue, different answer na. Right? Because we know that VL is not equal to VU if there is debt, if taxes are involved. VL is actually higher than VU. Right. So now let's see whether there's value to recapitalization if taxes are involved. Okay. Now assume a company wants to boost its stock price by recapitalizing. Okay. The company currently has 20 million shares outstanding. Okay. 20 million shares outstanding with a market price of $15 per share, head no debt. So currently, they are all, like, all equity. Okay? The company consistently pays stable earnings and pays 35% tax rate. Management plans to borrow $100 million on a permanent basis. And they will use the borrowed funds to repurchase outstanding shares. Okay? So uh, what happens to the value of equity because of this? 
Okay, first let's determine what is the value without leverage. Okay, so VU in this case. VU in this case is equal to what? Okay, since it's all equity, it's also equal to value of equity, which is $15 per share times 20 million shares outstanding. Okay, and therefore the total value of the unlevered firm is 300 million. Okay, if the value of the unlevered firm is 300 million, we know that the value of the levered firm will be higher than that because of tax yield, okay? Now, if they borrow 100 million using permanent debt, the present value of the firm's future tax savings is what? We can use this relationship because it is, it is permanent debt. So that's 35%, the tax rate times 100 million, which is the permanent debt level. And therefore, the increase in value is 35 million. So we know how much is the value of the levered firm Okay, equal to the value of an unlevered firm plus tax yield. So 300 million plus 335, 335 million. Now, because the value of debt is 100 million, the value of equity now becomes 23.5 million. Okay, is this better than the previous? Um, previous number of shares or previous price per share? Yes, okay, because before it is 15 per share on stock price, right? And how did that happen? That is um, essentially 300 million, a total firm value, which is firm value VF, which is equal to value of uh, the unlevered firm, which is equal to the value of levered, unlevered equity, you now divided by 20 million shares. Okay. Afterwards, what happened was the, the stock price. You no, know, the total value of equity is 235 million, lower in absolute amounts, but the number of shares were decreased. You no. Know? How much is the decrease in number of shares? So we know that there are 20 million shares outstanding. Nakapag-raise ka ng 100 million as permanent debt. So 100 million divided by $15 per share. Okay. So we're trying to determine the number of shares outstanding. Okay. So you're able to get 100 million. The price per share is 15 million. So you're able to redeem 6.67 million shares. Okay, right? And if you're able to repurchase 6.67 million shares, so from 20 million minus 6.67, ilan na lang yan? No? Therefore, meron ka na lang 13. 0.333 million shares. Okay. So if you divide here, 13.33, 235 divided by 13.33 million shares, the stock price increased to 17.63 per share than before, which is $15 per share. Okay. And this is due to the increase, due to the increase of uh, the firm value because of uh, the tax yield. Okay, so there's value related to uh, recapitalizations. Okay. Now, we extend the discussion on taxes, na hindi lang corporate taxes, but let's let's um let's consider personal taxes. Okay. Now the cash flows to investors are typically taxed twice: once at the corporate level and the ones again when they receive their actual interest or dividends. Okay. So yung tax yield sa nang galing yun. Ang tax yield ng galing sa corporate taxes. Taxes as the level of the corporation. 
Now, after matak sa corporation, matatanggap ng individuals yun, pera. Okay. Once individuals receive that money, at their level, it's going to be taxed. Okay. And because it's going to be taxed at their level, yung full impact ng interest tax yun, okay, will not be realized by personal investors fully. Right? Because matatax yung kanilang income. Okay? So therefore, the full benefit of um, core of the interest tax shield that we are we have discussed will not fully redound to the individual investor. Why? Because that income that they will receive will be taxed. No? And it might be offset. It might be the case that that uh, the tax shield has no impact to them because of their corporate taxes. Before, because of the difference between their corporate the corporate taxes and their personal taxes. Okay. So personal taxes, in other words, must be considered in the analysis, you know, at least in theory, to reduce because personal taxes may reduce the cash flows to investors and offset some of the benefits of leverage. Okay. So if you look at this, okay, uh, actual interest tax shield depends on both corporate and personal taxes. And to determine the true tax benefit of leverage, the combined effect of corporate and personal taxes needs to be evaluated. Okay. So if you look at this um, diagram, so for example, okay, for example, the EBIT is one dollar. Okay. If it is to be paid if all of it is to be paid as interest okay then the investor or the baru the creditor in this case will receive one dollar from the point of view of the creditor this interest of one dollar will only be beneficial to him after taxes right apply and lang niya ng taxes okay and tau i or ti here refers to the taxes on interest income okay so after taxes on interest income then yun yung total benefit to debt holders right okay pag ikaw naman ay equity holder okay what happens is matatax muna yan sa corporate income tax right kasi remember ibit pa lang ito hindi pa ito net income right so if that amount is to be paid to equity holders as dividends this amount must be taxed by in at the corporate level first, that's T sub C, okay, and then will be taxed at the level of the equity holders. And here we define tau E or T sub E as the equity, the tax on equity income or tax on dividends. Okay, so if you're an equity holder. If you will receive, if if one dollar is to be of EBIT is to be received by the deep by the shareholders, matatax muna yan at the corporate part. So ang matitira na lang one minus TC, right? And then matatax uli yan sa individual level, and therefore the amount that you receive, which is one minus tax, matatax uli one minus tax on equity, equity income. Okay, right? So, therefore, these, these personal taxes may offset the benefit of tax yields. Okay? And it, of course, it depends on the tax structure of the country. Now, how do you determine the effective tax advantage of debt? Okay, so that is T star, okay, which is the effective tax advantage of debt. Okay, so the debt will be advantageous, you no, know, because what happens here? One minus T i, okay. T i remember is the in tax on interest income, so this is the amount received by debt investors this portion is the amount received 
by equity investors. Okay? So therefore, as long as the amount received by debt investors is higher than the amount received by equity investors, then debt has a tax advantage. Okay? And we can simplify it by this one. I mean, just working on the math. Okay? So 1 minus 1 minus corporate tax times 1 minus equity income tax divided by 1 over the um, interest income tax. Okay. Now, what are some simplifi simplifications that will arise out of this formula? When there is no personal taxes on debt income, meaning uh, debt income or interest income no, has no taxes, or when the personal tax on debt and personal tax on dividend income are the same, then the formula reduces to T star equals TC. It means that the effective tax advantage of debt is fully equal no, to the corporate tax level. Okay. And therefore, there is full benefit of the, the benefit of uh, tax shield is fully realized by the investors. Okay. So yun yung implication yun. And the second implication here is if equity income is taxed less heavily, tax on equity is less than tax on interest income, no? then the tax, the, the effective tax rate, rate no, the effective tax advantage of debt will be lower than the corporate tax advantage, meaning the tax shield does not fully accrue no, to shareholders. Okay. Right? Because if equity income is taxed less, it means they'd rather receive it. I mean, means may must may value sa kanila ang, ang equity rather than debt. And so, therefore, there is less advantage for debt in that case. Okay, but if they are, uh, if if the taxes on debt and equity income is the same, no, then they're indifferent. I mean, they're indifferent, and therefore, the uh, benefit of interest tax shield is uh, fully realized by uh, by the shareholders okay now this is a good theoretical exercise right but in reality it is very difficult to implement okay so with personal taxes and permanent debt the value of the firm with leverage becomes this so uh, previously it was vl oops equals VU plus plus sorry it is VL equals VU plus um, corporate tax times debt now that we are considering personal taxes, it has to be T star, which is the effective tax advantage only. Okay, and remember that T star will be equal to TC if, okay, uh, the ta if yung dalawang circumstances kanina, the previous slide, no, when there is no personal taxes on debt income or when the personal tax on debt and equity income are the same, then T star becomes TC. And if T star is equal to TC, then we are back to our normal representation of this equation, no? wherein here, yung T star, magiging equal siya sa VL plus VL equals VU, plus TC times debt rather than T star. Okay? So 
So again, this will happen if T i is equal to 0 or T e is equal to T i. Okay. And that's when T star is equal to T c. And therefore, uh, the full benefit of uh, the tax shield is uh, realized. Okay. Personal taxes have a similar effect on the firm's weighted average cost of capital. However, we still compute work this way. We use TC and not T star. Okay, we'll discuss it more in the in a future lesson on valuation. Okay, we will leave it for now. With personal taxes, the firm's equity and debt cost of capital will adjust to compensate the investors for their respective tax burdens. The net result is that the personal tax advantage for debt causes the WAC to decline more slowly with, with leverage than it otherwise would. So, parang sinasabi lang niya na if there's a personal tax disadvantage, okay, then yung, di ba yung graph kanina, the WAC will reduce as debt increases. Right? If there is a personal tax advantage, then the slope of this curve will be lower. No? The slope will be lower and therefore not as steep as the full realization of the uh, interest tax yield. Okay? Remember how did, how did I discuss kanina this graph? So this is the graph, okay? Ito yung what unlevered, okay? If there is full realization, so this will be the R what levered. And this difference is due to the tax shield, okay? And as we increase debt, of course, the impact of the tax shield also increases. But if there's personal taxes, this this curve will swivel up, swivel upwards. No? Right? Because this naman is the impact of the personal taxes, which may offset the value created by the tax shield. Okay, so yun lang, yun lang yung ibig sabihin niya. Okay. So how do you determine the actual tax advantage of debt? No? Uh, several assumptions were made in estimating the effective tax advantage of debt. No? First, it is assumed that investors pay capital gains taxes every year. But in reality, Capital gains taxes are paid only when the investor sells a stock or an into debt position and realizing the gain. If you defer the payment of capital gains, then the present value will be lower and the impact no, on the negative impact on the tax yield will be lower. Okay? Investors with accrued losses that can use to offset gains face a zero effective capital gains tax rate. Ibig lang yung sabihin, kung loss yung investor, no, if my capital gain siya, pwedeng walang tax impact. No, kasi pang reduce lang yun ang loss, zero pa rin yung tax. So therefore, there is still a tax advantage in that case. Okay? So therefore, medyo shaky rin yung assumption that personal taxes will persist. No, kasi hindi siya madaling standardize because it depends. It has to, I mean, investors need to regularly trade so that they will have capital gains annually which might never happen. No. It was also assumed that the shareholder gains from additional earnings were evenly split between dividends and capital gains. So for firms with much higher or lower payout ratios, the average would not be accurate. Okay. And lastly, um, in addition, it was assumed that investors pay the top marginal federal income tax rate or the top marginal tax rate for individuals like you and me. So, pero pwede ka namang investor na nasa mid-rates ka and therefore your personal taxes will be lower. And if your personal taxes will be lower, the higher is the tax advantage to you of the tax shield. 
Okay? So, uh, mahirap siyang, i- in other words, mahirap siyang estimate. That's why usually, in practice, hindi na consider yung personal taxes. So, I mean, each individual investor will have to adjust his expectations based on his or her own tax, tax situation. Hindi na siya consider ng firm when the firm uh, decides on a capital structure. So parang ganun na lang yung naging mangyayari. Okay? Now the bottom line is that the effective tax advantage of debt is extremely difficult to determine. Okay? Because of course the tax advantage of debt will vary across firms and from investor to investor. That's why in practical terms, usually personal taxes are not considered anymore. We assume okay, there is an assumption Usually, there's an assumption that PE is equal to TI. Therefore, the tax ad- the effective tax rate is equal to the corporate tax rate. Okay, this is a simplifying assumption which makes it more practical in the real world. Okay, and if there is this assumption, then there is no need. No. Oops. So with this assumption, there is no need to compute for T star, right? And so there is no need to consider um, personal taxes in your WAC calculations, okay? Now, what are the limits to the tax advantage or tax benefit of debt? Okay. Well, the tax shield is only effective to the extent that the company has earnings to offset. Okay. Let's look at this company. Okay. So this company, without leverage, the EBIT is $1,000. $1, so the company without leverage has an EBIT of $1,000. Okay. So, therefore, net income, no? Tax savings from leverage is zero because there's no leverage. Okay. Pwede siyang magtaas ng leverage to the point that his interest expense is equal to EBIT. Right? And if that happens, then there will be no income before tax, no tax to be paid, and therefore his tax savings is $350, which is 1,000 times 35%. Okay, so this is the tax yield. However, if there's excess leverage, to the extent that the interest expense is higher than EBIT, okay, what is the tax savings from leverage? It's not 1 1 times 35%, right? Kasi zero para yung tax paid mo eh. In this case, okay? So there is a limit to the benefit of debt, right? It's only to the extent that you're able to get, to get um, lower taxes out of it. So if the matinang leverage point, okay, that you cannot get tax savings out of it, then that's the limit of debt in the capital structure. Of course, in reality, sometimes these laws can be carried over. So may tax advantage pa rin. Tawag dyan, net operating loss carry over. So pwedeng may tax advantage pa rin yan, right? Pero pwedeng dumating pa rin to the point, say 1,000. Then kunwari 3,000. Darating yung point na hi- impractical na yung nol ko amount eh na hindi na talaga siya ma-offset. And therefore, the tax advantage of leverage really has a limit on it. Okay? Understand? So, that is the theoretical tax, tax limit to the tax advantage of it. Okay? It is the point where you cannot absorb or you cannot 
um, determine savings anymore from taxes. And so therefore, wala na siyang benefit. Why should you go beyond? Why should you go to that point? Diba? Nalulugi ka lang. Diba? So, there is a theoretical limit to this. Actually, it's not a theoretical limit. It's a practical limit. Kasi wala na talagang tax advantage. Eh. Okay? So here, if the firm is not paying taxes where TC is equal to zero, then the tax disadvantage of excess leverage is this. Okay? So tax on equity minus tax on interest income. Okay? Right? So this is from a personal taxes perspective. Okay? But if you look at a corporate perspective, the optimal level of leverage from a tax saving perspective is the level such that the interest equals EBIT. Okay? The optimal level of leverage, the firm shields all of its taxable income and does not have any tax advantage in excess of that amount of interest. Okay? If you graph that, ah, hindi pa pala. Okay, baka nagkamali lang ako ng sunod-sunod. Dito muna tayo. No? If you graph that, what is the interpretation here? Okay. It means the expected tax savings increases the expected tax savings increases as interest rate increases. But at a certain point, Okay, the tax savings are already decreasing. Now, and at the same, at some point, that slope will be negative and will result to a negative, the tax savings will be less than what you had before. Okay, so at the optimal level of leverage, the firm shields all of its taxable income and it does not have any tax advantage excess interest. However, it is unlikely that the firm can predict its future EBIT, right? So, meron pa rin uncertainty doon. Okay? And therefore, there is risk. And that's the blue line. Okay? If there is uncertainty regarding EBIT, then the risk that interest will exceed, then there is a risk that interest will exceed, exceed EBIT. As a result, tax savings for high levels of interest falls, possibly reducing the optimal level of the interest payment. Okay, so in general, a firm's interest expense approaches its expected taxable earnings. The marginal tax advantage of that debt declines, limiting the amount of debt the firm should use. Okay? Right? Now, growth in debt. No? Growth will affect the optimal leverage ratio. Why will growth affect and the optimal leverage ratio, okay? Uh, you, because to avoid excess interest, a firm with positive earnings should have a level of debt such that interest payments are below its expected taxable earnings, okay? So kung mataas ang expectation mo ng EBIT growth, mataas din yung expectation mo dapat ng earnings that could be used as tax shield. And therefore, it allows you to have a higher debt level. Okay? Yun yung ibig sabihin dito. Right? So, from a tax perspective, the firm's optimal level of debt is proportional to its current earnings. However, when the value of the firm's equity will depend, depend on the growth of rate of earnings, the higher the growth rate, the higher that EBIT will be, and therefore, the optimal proportion of debt, you know, the higher the value of the equity, and therefore, it has an impact also in the proportion of debt in the, in the capital structure. Now, what's the summary of Amodigliani and Miller with taxes involved? Okay, Summary of that is that the value of an levered firm is equal to the value of an equivalent levered firm uh, minus the present value of the interest tax sheet. So VL equals VU plus PV interest tax sheet. The effective cost of debt is reduced by the impact of the tax sheet. And personal taxes impact no, how 
how these, these uh, investors perceive the value of the tax yield. Okay? And the optimal capital structure depends on the ability of the firm to capture the benefits of the tax yield. So if, can, if it can benefit, if it can capture the benefit more because it has a high EBIT, then there's an incentive to have higher uh, capital structure. Okay, that's it for this video. Thank you.